Are you ready, Elon? <laughs> yes, I am. Hello, then. It's, a, it's an honor and pleasure to introduce uh, the speaker, our speaker today, Elon. Uh, perhaps uh, no need for any introduction, but some facts about him. So, Elon is a Nathan and Lily Silver Chair in Stochastic Models at the School of Mathematical Sciences in Tel Aviv University. And uh, last but not least, he is the director of the Good to Know Project, so which works with talents, I think. And of course, he's a, he's a, a major scholar in game theory and stochastic games, especially. And an extra thing about him that he's also a writer, a science fiction writer. Unfortunately, if I see correctly, his books available only in Hebrew. So I don't know. Do you plan to to translate this book into English, or it's enough into if you? translated to Hungarian for me, actually. And today his talk is about repeated games with countably many players and tail measurable payoffs. So it is not a fairy tale, it's a very uh, scientific uh, talk. And his co-authors are Galit Eskenazi, uh, Janos Flash and Arkady Prodicinski. Galit is from Tel Aviv, Janos and Arkady from Maastricht University. Um, Elon, uh, the, the, the screen is yours. Please start your talk. Yeah, thank you very much, Miklos. Thank you, everyone, for coming. So the talk uh, indeed is on uh, repeated games, uh, many players, and uh, general pair function. So it all started last year in January, uh, just before the COVID uh, changed our lives. Janos was, visit was visiting Tel Aviv University uh, we've just, uh, the four of us just finished another project and Janos suggested working on repeated games with uh, Borel pair functions. That is general pair functions, not discounted, undiscounted, this is for the kids, but uh, real general pair functions, nasty pair functions, not continuous, not concave, nothing. So I, I don't, I, the only people I know that worked on uh, on uh, repeated games uh, with uh, general pair functions are uh, Maitra, Ashok Maitra and Bid Sadaf. So not too many people work on that. Uh, I understand why. I, mean, I, I suspected that nothing can be done with uh, such pair functions uh, with no structure. But heck, I mean, uh, working with Galit and uh, Janos and Arkady is uh, fun and uh, it promises many, many trips to Maastricht, which is a very nice city, so why not? So uh, we started working on it, and actually uh, in the last year, and uh, this last wonderful year, we had uh, quite a few results on this topic, and the one that I'm going to present uh, today is one of those results. And uh, anyone who starts to work on uh, repeated games with general pair functions must start with the work of uh, Blackwell in uh, 1953, Blackwell and Stewart. So Blackwell and Stewart in, uh, back in uh, 1953, they studied a very specific uh, class of games, very special class of games, alternating move games, zero sum. We have two players, player one and player two. Uh, player one plays in even periods, zero, two, four, etc., and player two plays in odd periods, one, three, five, etc. Note, time is discrete and it starts at zero. This is because those people uh, were math real mathematicians, set theorists, and set theorists start counting at zero and not at one. So uh, in those games, the action sets are arbitrary, not necessarily finite, not compact, arbitrary action sets. So player one chooses an action, then player two chooses an action, then player one chooses an action, etc. And we have a winning set. The winning set is a subset of the, of the set of infinite plays. And this is the winning set of player one. If the infinite play that the two players generated is in W, player one wins. If it is outside the W, player two wins. So this is the model that Blackwell and Stewart studied back in 1953. And they proved that if W, the winning set, is either open or closed, then the game is determined. That is, one of the players has a winning strategy. 
either player one has a strategy that guarantees that the infinite play will be within W, or player two has a strategy that guarantees that the, in, that the generated infinite play will be outside W. So the, the play, the game is determined. Uh, the question is what happens when W is not open and not closed? And then uh, Martin in 1975 proved that as uh, soon as W is a Borel measurable set in the product topology, then the game is determined. Moreover, the, there is a pure optimal strategy, a pure winning strategy to that player who can win the game. So this is our starting point. And then one can ask what happens when the game is not alternating move, but what happens when the players play simultaneously? We can also ask what happens if uh, the winning condition is not a winning condition, not a win-lose game, but there is some payoff function that depends on the infinite play. So this is the model that, uh, again, Blackwell, David Blackwell studied in 1969. So in 1969, Blackwell studied this model, player one and player two, they play simultaneously. In stage zero, they play simultaneously actions. In, in stage one, they choose action, stage two, and so on. So this is a repeated game as the one, the repeated game that we like, except that the payoff function is a general payoff function from uh, infinite plays into the wheels. Blackwell studied uh, the, the model when the game is zero sum, so that uh, there is only one payoff function, player one maximizes, player two minimizes. And he assumes that the function f is uh, actually a winning set. In, uh, in Blackwell 1969 paper, f is a winning set. It is the union of uh, countably many closed sets. And he proves uh, that in that case, the game uh, is not necessarily determined, but it has a value. Why isn't it determined? Well, because down here we have the matching pennies. The, ma the one shot matching pennies falls into the class of Black those Blackwell games. The two player uh, may play the, the repeated game, but the payoff depends only on what they play in the first stage. And player one wins if, uh, if they chose top left or bottom right, player two wins otherwise. So we have a game with a winning condition, but there is no, uh, the game is not determined, the value is one half. So in general, in Blackwell games, the ge uh, there is a value, but not necessarily the value need not be zero or one. So again, Blackwell proved that if the winning set is a, a, a countable union of closed sets, then the game is determined. Then in 1998, Martin uh, uh, did, made a, a huge leap, and he proved that in those games, as soon as the payoff function f is bounded and Borel measurable, then the game has a value in mixed strategies. Uh, I will talk about this proof in a moment. So this is our starting point. Uh, in uh, 1998. And then the natural question is, what happens in non-zero sum games? Okay, so zero sum games, again, this is for kids. What happens for non-zero sum games? Uh, does, do we have an epsilon equilibrium? So as usual in games with non-continuous payoffs, we cannot expect for, to have zero equilibrium. Indeed, in, do, in this class of games, also we do not have a zero equilibrium. Uh, for example, already in the single player case, if we have an action set of only zero one, then uh, for a, a proper payoff function, we do not have uh, a zero equilibrium. And what will be my discontinuous payoff function? So if the player chooses a bit in every period, then along the play, the player generates a number in, this, in the interval zero one, 
this is the binary representation. Uh, it chooses the binary representation of the number. And so the number that the player generates is the payoff unless the number is, is uh, one, 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 in which case we have a discontinuous payoff, the payoff is zero. So in that case, the value is one because the player can get as close a payoff as close to one as he wishes, but she cannot get the payoff of exactly one. So we cannot look for zero equilibria. We only uh, can look for is epsilon equilibrium. But the question is still whether an epsilon equilibrium exists. By the way, also uh, in uh, in Martin in Martin's proof in 1998, we assume that the number of actions is finite as is written here, the number of actions is finite because in games, uh, general uh, games, discontinuous uh, pair of games with uh, countable many actions, we do not necessarily have an equilibrium. We will see an example uh, later. So anyway, this is the, the question that we would like to solve whether in every uh, simultaneous move game with uh, two players, finitely many actions, bounded and Borel measurable payoff we have an epsilon equilibrium for every epsilon. This question is still open. So what will be our model? Our model will be, we will have a set I of players, not necessarily two. We will have, uh, and as the title of my talk suggests, we, have, we will have countably many players. Uh, AI is the set of actions of player I. It will be finite for every I. A is the product set of action profiles with the product topology and uh, a, a to the power n to the power integers. So a to the power n in the set is the set of plays in the infinitely repeated game. And then for each player i, we have a bounded by zero one and Borel measurable pair function fi. So this is the model. Questions so far? Now, the question is still open. So we have uh, to find uh, simpler setups where we can do something. And then what we, uh, what we do is we study tail measurable payoffs. What is a tail measurable function? So a function f from infinite plays to zero one is tail measurable if it doesn't depend on the first K, uh, K stages, the play in the first K stages. That is, whenever we have two plays, two infinite plays that coincide from some point T and on, then we, we get the same payoff. So the payoff in, so the action uh, that the players play in the first five stages or the first 10 stages of the first 20 stages do not affect the overall payoff in the game. So this is tail measurability. For example, there are many, many examples of such interesting functions. For example, the, if we have stage payoffs, so ut is the state, the, the payoff at stage t uh, is, the, the, is the, by a function ut from action profiles. And then the total payoff of a player is the limb soup, not the limb, but the limb soup of the average payoff up to stage t. So the limb soup of average payoffs is tail measurable because the limb soup of averages do not, uh, does not depend on play in the first one million stages. Uh, some other payoff function uh, that is tail measurable, suppose that we would like the action profile A star to play at all stages T that are prime numbers from some prime number and on, and it is zero otherwise. So only if you, the action profile A star is played in stage five and seven and 11 and 13 and so on from some prime number and on, then I get the payoff of one. So I do not know why I would like to have such a payoff function, but this is a tail measurable function. Computer scientists, they love tail measurable payoff functions. 
So uh, if you are uh, uh, the Bucci uh, payoff function, this payoff function is one if the action profile is some uh, pre-specified set of action profiles A star infinitely often. So if we chose either top left or bottom right infinitely often, then I get one. Otherwise, I get zero. We, uh, we also have a Kobuchi payoff function, which is one if top left and bottom right were chosen only finitely many times. So action profiles in the present pre-specified set A star are chosen finitely many times. We have the parity evaluation, which means that uh, we order this, the set of action profiles according to some uh, order, and then the action, the least action profile that occurred infinitely often uh, is in some pre-specified set A star. We have a Muller payoff function which is an action profiles appear infinitely often if and only if it is in some pre-specified action profile. And then I get one, otherwise I get zero. Now, any function of tail measurable functions is tail measurable. So the sum of two tail measurable functions is tail measurable, the product, the whatever exponent, the what, whichever function you would like to uh, have is uh, tail measurable. So there, there is a rich family of such pair functions. And this is the, the class that we handle in this paper. Now the discounted payoff is not immeasurable because the discounted payoff depends on the payoff in the first stages. The first 1 million stages determine the discounted payoff up to one minus epsilon. So uh, what to epsilon, whatever. So anyway, uh, the discounted payoff is not tail measurable. So we know now what is and what is not tail measurable. Now, if the payoff function is tail measurable, then the mean max value of the player is independent of the history, right? Because the history does not depend, uh, sorry, the payoff in a tail measurable, uh, when my payoff is tail measurable, my payoff is independent of whatever happened in the first five stages. So the, my mean max value is independent of what happened in the first five stages. This means that the history of the game does not affect uh, up to the finite history of the game does not affect the mean max value. And this is uh, an important property of tail measurable, uh, of repeated games with tail measurable payoffs that we will use. So this is our uh, main result. Suppose that the set of players is countable. Each player has a finite set of actions and the pair functions are bounded by zero and one and they are Borel measurable and tail measurable. In that case, an epsilon equilibrium exists for every epsilon. Now, it is interesting to note that one shot gains with uh, Borel measurable payoffs do not admit, and uh, sorry, with, tail, uh, with Borel measurable payoffs do not admit an epsilon equilibrium. And this is an example we will see in a moment. It was given by Wurnevel, uh, whom I've seen uh, earlier here. So, though one shot gains with countably many players do not admit an equilibrium, uh, repeated games with countably many players and, Borel and the tail measurable payoffs do admit an epsilon equilibrium. Now I would like to present a slight extension of the result. Um, so uh, for that, let me introduce a new concept, uh, a function f Thank from infinity, excuse me? Maybe a preview of, of the example. Does the counter example that you mentioned for the one shot depend on the fact that there are countably many players? Yes. Generated for the finitely many players? No, because we know that for finitely many players, finite action okay. sets, we know that the equilibrium exists. Okay. Yes, of course. Yeah. yeah. So 
So this extension uh, is dedicated uh, to Abraham, and you will understand why, uh, to Abraham Neyman, you will understand why the next slide. So uh, a tail function f from infinite place to 0, 1 is called finite um, approximable if up to epsilon it is determined by a finite number of coordinates, like the discounted payoff. That is, for every epsilon, there is t and the function g epsilon from histories of length t to 0, 1, such that f of the infinite play is equal up to epsilon to g epsilon of the first t stages. So we can approximate the, the, the function f, which depends on the infinite play up to epsilon by a function that depends only on the first t stages. Elon? Yes. When, when the action set is finite, as I see you do in this next theorem, is, isn't this just equivalent to it being continuous? Yeah. Um, okay, yes. Indeed. Okay. Yeah, so a finite approximate is continuous. Okay, so this is a theorem by uh, John Levy. And now, so if the set of players is finite, the set of actions are finite, the payoff functions are Borel, and the sum of a tail measurable payoff function and a finite, a continuous function, then an epsilon equilibrium exists for every epsilon. The proof is an immediate consequence of our existence proof, which is uh, divide the game into two. Okay, we fix epsilon, we would like to construct a two epsilon equilibrium. So let us approximate the, uh, so we know that fi, the payoff of player i, is the sum of, uh, of a tail measurable payoff and a continuous payoff and a continuous function. So we approximate the continuous part up to epsilon by the first t stages. And then we essentially divide again into two halves, the play up to period t and the play after period t. In the first t stages, we play an equilibrium in the game with the continuous pair function. We ignore the tail, measure, the, the tail measurable part because that is not affected by, by what happens in the first t stages. So we play an equilibrium for the continuous part of the payoff. And then after stage t, we apply our theorem to get an epsilon equilibrium in the infinite game after stage t. And this way we play an, in the first t stages a zero equilibrium for the approximation of the continuous part of the payoff. And then afterwards an epsilon equilibrium in the, for the tail measurable payoff. In this way, we get a two epsilon equilibrium in the original game. Note that here. Hey, hey, Lon. Yes. Uh, can't you strength, strengthen this result by a form, form that is saying that it is eventually uh, tail measurable? That you say that uh, uh, I for think... every epsilon. I think that an eventually tail measurable is tail measurable. I think. I think you need an no, eventually no, 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 no. epsilon uh, tail, epsilon it, it, it approximately. May, it may be that for every sequence of 10 actions, 10 periods, there is a different tail measurable payoff function. So it is not a priori tail measurable. It depends on the first 10 coordinates and the tail. Okay, so maybe it would work. I do not know. Because then if it's finitely many players, you simply could take this uh, finite horizon and put the terminal payoff, which is the payoff of this action plus the tail, plus an equilibrium of the tail game. Yeah. And, and you yes. do the backward, backward induction. Yes, yes, that's true. This is, uh, yeah, this is, I think it is equivalent to what I said. I'm not sure, but, uh, but you're absolutely right. Yeah. And as long as Abram is here, Abram, don't you and Mertens have a 
result also on uh, Borel payoff, equilibrium with Borel payoffs? Yes, but this is in uh, games with perfect information. Ah, okay. All right. Yeah. Just vaguely. So, yeah, so Martens and Neyman indeed have a proof uh, for uh, alternating move games, multiplayers with bounded and Borel measurable payoffs, but not for simultaneous move. Okay, so then, uh, uh, now why this uh, slide extension, why did I mention it? This is because of the following result, a recent result uh, due to uh, Abraham Neyman, uh, which considered the concept of valuations. So a function f, so suppose now that the players receive a stream of payoffs. In every period, the players receive a payoff as we love in repeated games. So we have a stage payoff. And the only question is, what is the evaluation of a player for an infinite stream of payoffs? So suppose that my evaluation, uh, sorry, so a function f from 0, 1 up to n, to, uh, so stream of payoffs to r is evaluation if first it is Borel measurable. So we would like it to be measurable. Then we would like it to be additive. So the evaluation of, a, of a, the, the sum of two streams is the, the sum of the evaluations. And we also uh, assume here a time value of money, uh, a, a property, which is if we have two sequences, two streams of payoffs, x's and y's. So x1, x2 is one stream of payoffs, y1, y2, etc., is a, a second stream of payoffs. Suppose that the partial sums of x is always larger than the partial sums of y. Okay. In that case, we, uh, if we value time, uh, then we would like to get uh, the money earlier. Then in that case, we would like to assume that f of the x's is at least as much as f of the y's. So we, uh, we say that uh, any function from stream, infinite streams of payoffs to R is evaluation if it satisfies those three properties. Uh, Elon? Elon, since you quote me, so just terminology, the top definition is a definition of a measurable valuation. And you need still that f of the constant streams of one equals one. Yeah, so the-, the Normalization. Yeah, so indeed you, uh, you have a normalization. I don't need it. Okay, because there you no have uh, something else in mind. Um, okay. Yeah, and this is indeed a measurable valuation. Iran, did you want to? Uh, yes, if, if it takes you too far, then ignore me. But uh, can you give an example of a valuation which is tail measurable? You, you mean th this, this valuation? Yeah, valuation according to uh, this definition, which is tail measurable. Because uh, I mean, my, you, my first you, you guess take, would be- you, you, take a measurable, you take a measurable Banach limit. Is there such a thing as Borel Banach limit? Yes. There, there is a Borel function that is in between the lim, which is a linear function on streams, which is in between the lim inf and the lim sup. You need axioms of choice for it, yes. But it's Borel, it is Borel. Okay. Uh, Borel or, or Lebeg that I don't remember. Ah, Lebeg, okay, but you say Borel. Yes. Uh, okay, never mind. Okay. I mean, my guess would be that any such Borel function, which is additive and also have any reasonable property is immediately continuous, but maybe I'm, uh, maybe I'm wrong. Okay. Oh, okay. So in that case, uh, this uh, theorem is really easy. Uh, in that case, but anyway, uh, uh, Merale and Neyman prove that every valuation is the sum of a tail measurable function and a finite approximable, a continuous function. And therefore, as a corollary of our previous result, uh, in every repeated game with finitely many players, finitely finite action sets, stage payoff functions, 
where the evaluations of all players of strings of payoffs are using such measurable valuations uh, than an epsilon equilibrium exists. So maybe there are indeed no such cases, uh, and then it is uh, I, going, uh, In so my paper, there is no, uh, on valuations, nothing about measurability. Right. You don't have measurability, but we need measurability. Okay. Yeah. Um, OK. So now let's uh, go on to uh, Wunnevel's uh, example, counter example for the existence of uh, of uh, epsilon equilibrium in games with countably many players. Now, um, now uh, this example will actually lead us to the construction, to the proof of our result. So Wunnevel's example concerns a, one sh a, a minority game. So we have countably many players. The players are 0, 1, 2, etc. Each player has two actions, 0 or 1. And the payoff of a player is 1 if he is in the, mi in the minority. That is, uh, we look how many players chose 1. That, but we have countably many players. So we take the upper density the lean soup of the averages of players who chose one. So if this lean soup, the upper density of players who chose one is strictly higher than half, then it means that the majority of players chose one. And then I would like to choose zero. If the majority of players did not choose one, then I would like myself to choose one. So this is uh, the example, and this is a variation of a uh, Telex example from 1969 when there is no zero equilibrium. But in this example, there is no epsilon equilibrium for every epsilon smaller than half. And why is that? So suppose that uh, there is an equilibrium X in mixed strategies. Consider the set E which is the majority of players chose one. So this set is tail measurable, but note here tail measurable is not with respect to time. This is with respect to players. We have infinitely many players, and therefore we ask uh, whether the majority of players choose one. So this condition is independent of the first five players, whether the first five players chose one or zero, does not affect uh, whether the set E, or whether the, the ch choice of all players, the majority of all players is one or not. So this set E uh, is tail measurable, and therefore by Levy zero one law, it has probability either zero or one under X. Okay. So it means that under the equilibrium, either with probability one, uh, the majority of the players play choose uh, one, but then everyone wants to choose zero. In particular, those players who chose one would prefer to choose zero. Or the other way around, uh, the probability one, uh, the majority is zero, and then everyone wants to choose one. And therefore, there is no uh, epsilon equilibrium for epsilon smaller than half. OK? I see that someone, uh, Kolmogov of zero one law. Not Levy, are you sure? Anyway, I'm, I'm sure that you are more sure than me. So, Kolmogorov. Okay, so uh, this is the one shot, uh, the one shot uh, example. And uh, now let's consider uh, the repeated game. So now the players are going to play Wurnevel's game in every period. What is the goal of the player in the infinite game? My goal is to lose Wurnevel's one-shot game only finitely many times. So I would like to win Wurnevel's game from some stage T and on. Okay, so this, this is the FI payoff function. And it is tail measurable because I would like to, to win the one-shot game from some period T and on. 
And I claim that in this game, in this infinite repeated game with countably many players, an equilibrium does exist. And in this equilibrium, everyone gets one. So that everyone wins from some point on. And what is the equilibrium? Here it is. Okay. So in every period, in every period I, oh, sorry, in every period T, player zero up to T will play one, and players T plus one up to infinity will play zero. So in stage zero, only player one will play one, the rest play zero. So player one is happy, he's in the minority, he gets one. In the second stage, one and two play one, and the rest play zero. So again, one and two are happy, they are in the minority and so on. So in this case, in every period, almost all players play zero, but each player, I from stage I and on, is in the minority and he gets one. So this is the zero equilibrium that we have in Vournevel's repeated game. Now, how do we generalize this? Uh, insight into a proof for any repeated game. So the idea would be to find an infinite play that yields all players a high payoff, where high means at least the min max value minus epsilon, and then to play a green trigger strategy. So the players will follow this infinite play and any deviation is, is uh, detected immediately and punished. Okay, so this will be our, uh, our, pro our approach. The only question is how do, we, uh, how do we construct this infinite plane? And this is the intricate point uh, in the proof. So let us see how we do that. So for that, we go back to Martin, Martin's original proof. So again, in 75, Martin proved that alternating move gains, zero sum alternating move gains with Borel measurable winning set W is determined. And in 1998, every two player zero sum simultaneous move gain with finitely many actions and bounded Borel measurable payoffs has a value. Now to prove the 1998 result, Martin used the 1975 result. What I'm going to do now is to, um, is to show Martin's proof. So this is Martin's 1998 proof. For every real number V, we define an auxiliary gain, an auxiliary alternating move gain, G of V, as follows. In this game, player one will, def will uh, define a long play, a function D that is defined over finite histories. Player two will choose an infinite play in our game, in an, our simultaneous move game. So this is what they do along the play. Player one in the auxiliary game chooses a pair of function D, uh, a, a function D from histories, player two chooses an infinite play. So we set D of the empty history to be V. V is the parameter. Then at stage zero, player one will select a real number D of A0 for every action pair A0 uh, that is possible in the first stage. So that player one actually chooses a payoff matrix, a payoff matrix over the action sets A1 and A2, which are finite. Now, player one is restricted to choose such Ds so that the value of the D that he chose is at least the D of the empty set, which was V. So this is a restriction on the, of the choices of player one. Then, in stage one, the other player, player two, selects one of those entries, one of the an action profile A0 hat. Next, in, stage, uh, in the next stage, uh, stage two, 
player one will again select an A1 times A2 payoff, uh, payoff function, D of the, so here it is A hat zero. Uh, it, it, it might depend on A hat zero. And this choice uh, is, uh, must satisfy that the value of this function is at least D of the A hat zero. Okay, so D, D of uh, this, this uh, quantity was selected by player one in stage zero, and the A zero hat was selected by player one in stage one. And then again in stage three, player two selects an action profile A hat one, and so on and so forth. So in every even stage 2T, player, the players already chose D of all finite histories of length smaller than T, and uh, player one and player two cho chose uh, a history, a, fi a finite play up to stage T. And then in stage 2T, player one selects uh, D of A0 hat, A1, A1 hat, A2 hat, up to A T hat, and uh, a, a matrix, such a matrix, uh, such that its value is at least the, the D of the current history that player two chose, and then player two selects an, uh, the continuation action profile. And the winning condition in this game is that player one wins the game if the lean soup of the Ds of the partial histories is smaller than the F of the infinite history. So if the F of the infinite play is larger than the lean soup of the D, player one wins, otherwise player one loses. So this is the game that Martin uh, defined. And the, the way we should think about D, about this game is as follows. Suppose that player one would like to prove to player two that, that he can ensure that the value of the, of the simultaneous move game is at least V. So this is the goal of player, of player one. The value of the infinite stage game is at least V. So how does he do it? He, he selects a continue, a, 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 a value, a, a, some quantity D of A0 to every action profile A0. And they, and, and then player two, uh, uh, sorry, and the, and the interpretation of this quantity D of A0 is that the, the value of the continuation game that starts at A0 is at least D of A0. So if indeed player one is correct and the value of the continuation game is at least D of A0, then this condition that the value of D of A0 is at least D of the empty set means that if indeed uh, the value of the continuation is at least D of A0, then the value of the original game is at least V because the value of D of A0 is at least V. And then player one, player two chooses one action profile, A0 hat, and says, okay, prove to me that the value of the continuation game is at least D of A0 hat. So to, to prove that, the players uh, continue uh, recursively. And if indeed at the end, the, the, the payoff to player one in the, in the sim simultaneous move game is at least the limb soup of the Ds, it means that he succeeded in showing that, that the value that the, his payoff is at least the Ds. Okay. So this is uh, uh, Martin's construction. Now, how does the, uh, so for every V, the game is determined. The higher V, the more difficult it is to prove that the value is at least V. So if V is small, then uh, note that the only, uh, the only place in this game D of V that V uh, is uh, taken into account is D of the empty set. So the higher V, the less options player one has in the first period, and therefore he has fewer strategies and he can win less. So the lower V player one can, uh, the, uh, the more probabilities that for player one to win, the higher V, it is easier for player two to win. 
therefore there is V star such that player one wins for every V below V star, player two wins for every v, a v above V star, and Martins proved that V star is exactly the value of the simultaneous move game. Now, what is important for us is the next statement, the following one, which is, suppose that V is smaller than V star. So player one can win Martin's game. Suppose we have a strategy pair in G of V under which D, sorry, we have a strategy pair in the original game, in the original simultaneous move game under which D, the function D, is a sub-marting game. So such a strategy pair guarantees a pair of V to player one. So it guarantees a player V to, play, uh, to the player. Okay. So again, if we have a strategy pair in the original game, in the original sim simultaneous move game, so under which D, this function D is a sub martingale so it increases in expectation. Then this strategy profile generates a payoff, which is at least V. Okay, uh, why is that? Uh, this is because um, if, uh, if, uh, it is a, if D is a sub martingale after such a strategy, then the limit of the Ds exists with probability one. So this limit exists. And it is below F because player one wins the game G of V. So what we know is that V is equal to the D of the empty set. Since D is a sub martingale, the limit exists and the expectation of the limit is at least D of the empty set. And this expectation is, be, is below the expectation of F because player one wins the game G of V. Okay, so we know that such a strategy which is under which this sub martingale guarantees high payoff. Now we can modify the function D so that it is it also satisfy a sub a sub a sub game perfectness uh, condition, which is the value of the one shot game D is at least V, not only for the uh, in the for the history of length one, but for every history. So after every, after every finite history, the value of the Ds uh, is at least V. And now given that, um, we can, uh, we can uh, derive the following conclusion, which is uh, after we, we change D in such a way, and if we have a strategy sigma under which this new D is a sub martingale, then the expected payoff under such a strategy sigma is at least V for given any finite history H. Okay. So this change, this modification of D allows us to conclude this, uh, this property that is a function that uh, under which D is a sub martingale uh, yields a pair of at least V to every finite history, given any finite history. And this is what we need, sorry? Is the, is the addition, is that due to the fact that it's tail measurable? This is where you use tail measurability? No, here we still do not use tail measurability. Um, here uh, we can do with uh, Borel measurability. We need tail measurability in a moment uh, to uh, to assume that, uh, to show, uh, because we assume that the value V is independent of the history. This is where we use tail measurability. So now we can prove our main result. So Martin indeed proved his result only for two player zero sum games. We can extend his result, uh, it's not too difficult to extend it to any number of players, also to countably many players. Okay, with some caveat, I won't have time to, uh, to dwell on it. We can dwell on it late uh, after the talk uh, uh, in the uh, question time. But anyway, Martin's result applies for games with countably many players. 
So we denote by VI the min max value of player I, and we denote by DI Martin's function D, but with respect to player I, I's min max value. That is, we initiate DI of the empty set by VI minus epsilon. So it is below VI, and therefore player I can, can show that he can win the game. He can prove that his min max value is at least di of the empty set. And we all, what we also know is that the value of the one shot for every history HD, the value of the one shot game of the, this, this uh, matrix game, whose payoff is di of HT and the, the next action profile is at least di of the current history. And also we know that the value of this one shot game is at least vi minus epsilon. So this is what we take for Martin. Again, this is true, whatever be the pair function, Borel or Tay. Now, in Vornevelt's game, a repeated game, this was our zero equilibrium. What our equilibrium in our epsilon equilibrium in our repeated game will be similar. We are going to fix for every player I, some action AI has, arbitrary action. This is the zero action that the players play, played uh, before they become important in the Wurnevelt's repeated game. So until stage I minus one, I don't care about, about my payoff. I'm player I, I'm sure I will get my payoff after stage I. Until stage I, I will not get a payoff. And therefore I play the action uh, AI has. What the other players will play, so the other players in every period I, we, we, we have only finitely many important players, players that we have to take care about. And we have to ensure that Verdi is a sub martingale so that they get high payoff. How do we ensure it? Well, they will play an equilibrium in the one shot game with continuation payoffs D. Okay, so in each stage, uh, T, in each stage T, player zero up to T will play a one-shot game, will play an equilibrium in a one-shot game that involves only them, player zero up to T. The other players, T, T plus one, T plus two, they play their dummy action, okay? Their action which is not important. So we fix them, we throw them away from the game, we are left with finitely many players. Now those players, zero up to T, they play a game whose payoff is their continuation DI. Since they, get, they play an equilibrium in this game, the equilibrium payoff is at least the min max. So we have an equilibrium, uh, which means that the expectation of the D of the continuation is at least the value of this game D, which is at least D of the current stage. So the Ds are indeed the sub martingale and they are also at least VI. So that this sub martingale gives us at least VI after every history, I mean, for every initial history. So this is the idea of the proof uh, that in every period, uh, in every finite period, actually we have only a finite stage game because infinitely many players, T, T plus one, T plus two, uh, they play a dummy action, and the rest they play an equilibrium in a one shot game with continuation to of T. So, this strategy profile sigma star, under which this strategy profile di is a sub martingale from stage i and on, and therefore uh, the expected payoff of player i after every history h is at least vi minus epsilon at least the D of the MP history. And this is for every H. Now, if this condition occurs uh, with probability one after every H, so it means that, uh, with, prob that with probability one, Fi might, must be at least Vi minus epsilon. So if the, the conditional expectation of F given every history is at least vi minus epsilon, it means that fi is at least vi minus epsilon with probability one. So we know that for every player i, fi is at least vi minus epsilon with probability one, 
which means that there exists at least one infinite play under which all players get at least vi minus epsilon. And this is the play that we want for our equilibrium. We found one play that gives all players at least vi minus epsilon. And then we use a green trigger strategy. And that's the end of the proof. So if you ask, where did we use tail measurability? So we use tail measurability first to assume VI is independent of the history. Okay, so here, when we conditioned, the, uh, uh, we, we set the conditional proof is at least VI minus epsilon. Okay, it is the VI of the current history, but it is the same for all histories. Also, which means that, okay, and, and this is essentially where we use it. Now, this method, of uh, constructing an, a good strategy profile by playing an equilibrium in a one-shot game with continuation payoffs uh, that, are set, that are chosen in some way, our function B. This is actually adapted from uh, an old paper of Nicola Vie and myself from 2002, uh, something in stochastic games. So it was useful also here. So now I will uh, end, end uh, the talk with future research, open problems. So as I said, I, I don't know uh, anything actually that was done on non-zero sum repeated games, uh, simultaneous move with uh, measurable, with uh, general pair of functions. Okay, so uh, there is a lot of work to do. For example, uh, so uh, the question I started with, two player repeated game with finite action sets and Borel measurable payoffs, not tail measurable payoffs. Do we have an equilibrium or an epsilon equilibrium or not? So this is an open problem. We can also study stochastic games. Okay, so Nicola Vieille proved uh, in 2000 that every two player stochastic game with finitely many states and actions where the payoff is the lean soup of the average payoffs the average stage payoffs, uh, it has an epsilon equilibrium. What happens if we have uh, tail measurable payoffs? Will we then have, uh, have an uh, epsilon equilibrium? So we have partial results on, uh, on this question, but still nothing definite. Also, we can ask what happens in alternating move games, like the original uh, games of uh, of Blackwell and Martin 75 with monitoring structure. So the players do not necessarily observe each other actions. Iran Shmaya studied this problem when we have eventual perfect monitoring. So eventually the players know each other actions. But what happens if we do not have eventual perfect monitoring? Then uh, then we have some extensions, but uh, the question essentially is still wide open. Thank you very much. The, the alternating move you are speaking even on the, with monitoring structure, even for the two person zero sum. Yes, yes two person zero sum, even winning set, the winning uh, set for player one, the basic uh, model. And Iran, you can uh, correct me if uh, more is known about it. I mean, I think there are uh, easy examples that uh, with arbitrary monitoring structure, there is no uh, value, there is no equilibrium, but I don't know if... Yeah, already in your paper, you, pr you provided example where the general monitoring structure, there is no value, it would not be a value, okay. but then whether in some specific simpler uh, monitoring structures, whether there is a value. Elon, so you have this epsilon equilibrium result. So my computer went on, so I joined to Helmut. So uh, I'm sure that you have in mind some examples. Perhaps I can guess which ones. So. Have you have you look at, uh, looked at looked at uh, which is the limits of the epsilon epsilon equilibria? So you take the take the epsilon smaller and smaller, 
and and uh, and then you have a sequence. And of course, because if you take the additive set functions, probability set functions of each star compact sets, it has some limits. Have you checked which are the limits in these concrete examples of, of your sequence of, of epsilon equilibria? No, no. And whether you have a fault theorem, I do not know. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, the question? Ah, sorry. Uh -huh, uh, okay. I, I, I was going to ask about the Fock theorem. It seemed to me that uh, the tail durability uh, says that you can, it's never too late to start punishing somebody, right? Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that you were saying that in the end, every path that is is uh, individually rational, every, every play path that is individually rational uh, is supported by an equilibrium and your argument was to show that there exists some path like that. Yeah. Is exactly. it the correct way? To... Yes. So th there is in a way some kind of a fork theorem here that says that uh, every, uh, every payoff that is individually rational and is feasible in the game uh, is supported by an equilibrium or and, yes. and, and the, the difficulty is to show that there exists such a, such a thing, or am I? So indeed, uh, every payoff vector that is individually rational and feasible by a pure a, a play, by an infinite play, is an equilibrium, uh, an equilibrium uh, payoff. But can we have additional payoffs that are not supported by a single play? If we mix, we play mixed uh, infinitely often, okay. and uh, and uh, we actually we have examples that that there might be such equilibria. I I am not sure to understand the issue of individual rationality for a Borel payoff uh, Borel payoff function. So, what do you mean a part that is individually rational? It is at least with respect, with, with, with respect to the initial individual rational level or given any history of it? So here we have tail measurability and therefore so, we, we no, no, it, Yes, but uh, Iran was asking about the cases when there is no tail measurability. Okay. And there is no, no, I was, I was talking about, uh, with, I mean, I was, I meant the initial uh, uh, min max level and using the fact that with tell measurability they are the same throughout the game. I mean, I wasn't saying anything complicated. Ah, I think I was... Tell measurability, okay. okay. So if you do not have tell measurability, then essentially you have a stochastic game, right? Because the, your actions in the past may, uh, may uh, lead you to a completely different payoff function. And therefore essentially you have a stochastic game with countably many states. Okay, and then even if when we have the, the, the payoff function is the limit of the averages, which is tail measurable, we do not know whether an equilibrium exists. Okay, so, so it's not clear uh, how to handle such a case. Oh, it, actually it is difficult. Okay, more questions? If no further questions, then thank you very much, Ailon, again. Thank you.